thanks again for inviting me. Uh, it's just so great to be back with, with people from the Department of Ophthalmology at, at the U of I. Um, as Peter mentioned, um, I was at the U of I from 1989 till 2014 when I went to Doha, Qatar, actually ran into Deepak in Saudi Arabia over there, did some patient safety work with him because it was a less than hour flight uh, over to, to be there and join him at the King Khaled Eye Specialist Hospital. So very quickly to kind of orient people to uh, kind of this work, um, I did a residency in uh, pediatrics first at Boston Children's Hospital. Then I did anesthesia at the Brigham and a fellowship in Pease Anesthesia Critical Care and wrapped all that up in 1988 and moved to Chicago and joined the faculty at U of I as well as Michael Reese Hospital. That'll become really important in a minute related to a, a kind of a famous patient harm case that had at U of I, the connection to Michael Reese. And... Um, and began my work in 1989. Importantly, in the first three years, I got really well connected with uh, the retina specialists um, at the U of I because I took care of several children who ended up dying from shaken impact syndrome. And a lot of what was used to help identify that, again, was a lot of the pretty massive retinal hemorrhages that were found in these children and I got involved in the legal proceedings related to uh, the prosecution of the people who ultimately ended up admitting the fact that they had, had uh, actually inflicted this non-accidental trauma on these kids. And during that time, I found the law absolutely fascinating. And so right around that time, I was asked because of my experience uh, in pediatrics and peds anesthesia and the fact that so many pediatric patients uh, were treated at the eye and ear infirmary. And there was a standalone set of, I think six ORs, Joel, I think we had at the time. Plus we created a really cool uh, exam room where we did a lot of exams under anesthesia with a variety of the, the experts within ophthalmology created this really great setting. I was asked to help um, run the ORs uh, uh, at the eye and ear infirmary starting in 1992 and was there throughout until ultimately those ORs got moved over to the main hospital. Of course, broke my heart because it was, it was an incredible center of excellence to be at the eye and ear infirmary having these six ORs. And it was just great because anytime there was a patient who needed a consult, they would just stop into the office that was there. Um, it, was, it, was, it was really, really efficient and our outcomes were, were pretty spectacular. Um, but I just loved working uh, at the Eye and Ear Infirmary. And even when it moved over to the main hospital, we kind of kept it at a, as a separate service for quite a while where I had a relatively small number of anesthesiologists who would work with um, the team. We, have any, we even kept a separate call team to manage all the eye trauma cases that would come in and again, try to handle those efficiently. So it was a wonderful opportunity. And then um, what happened was, and I'll talk about this uh, as we move into it, this whole idea around the interface between law and medicine and why it became really important at the, at the University of Illinois at this time. So, so one of the things that becomes really important for me in, in the patient harm events was the, the need to connect the heart with the head. And there's a couple of cases I'm gonna share with you that really drove a lot of this. And oh my gosh, I see Jake Walensky there. Jake, hello, amazing to see you and Joel on this. I so miss give, doing anesthesia for you guys, uh, especially at the old eye and ear infirmary. It was pretty spectacular. Um, but anyway, so, so when I was in Boston and we were looking at this, there was this TV show on, on uh, uh, complications in the OR related to anesthesia screw ups of which we had many. Uh, and this discusses the, the, the 6,000 uh, patients who would die or suffer brain damage from carelessness every year. And this was a real call to arms at the time. This is in the early 1980s. And um, fortunately, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, of which I was a member, put a team together to look at uh, what was happening that was causing all this harm. Ultimately, that led to the development of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. And a look at all of these closed claims, why were these lawsuits happen and how could we change the way we deliver anesthesia to reduce a lot of this harm? 
And so based on all this work in a very short order, they totally changed the way that we were providing anesthesia from again, 1982 until uh, 1986. And what was fascinating was uh, what, what these changes did as it related to anesthesia mortality, where in 1982, the risk that, that we would have a serious mishap on the anesthesia side that would lead to brain death uh, or death itself went from one in 2000 to one in 400,000. And, and the reason is, well, what changed? Well, what changed was in 1983, the only way we knew how much oxygen was in the blood of our patients was the color of the blood. And of course, in an eye case, as my colleagues will say, you often didn't know until you pulled the drapes down and something catastrophic had, had you realized had happened. Also, for the patients who needed to be intubated, the only way we knew that the breathing tube is in the right place was listening to breath sounds, which is not very accurate. And so the two things that happened that changed everything from 82 to 86 was the requirement that 100% of patients where an anesthesiologist was involved, included the use of pulse oximetry and capnography if we were gonna be intubating them or even using nasal cannula oxygen. And it has made a huge difference in that kind of harm that occurred. And it saved a ton of money um, from the medical malpractice standpoint. So along comes uh, to air as human. This is a really critical part from the ACGME perspective. It came out in 1999, it really, push the patient safety movement. A lot of the work from anesthesia was in this book. It came out two years after I graduated from law school in 97, and it speaks to the amount of preventable harm that happens every year in health systems. And it was a really, really, really important you know, book that was out there. Along that same time, and again, we have our own case that happened at the U of I I'm gonna share, is, is this the wall of silence, which is at that time, it was all too common that when bad things happened, we wouldn't talk about it with patients and families, and we certainly wouldn't talk about it amongst each other. The advice from legal counsel at that time, and even at the U of I, as you'll see, was don't talk about it. And there's a big belief that this wall of silence contributed to a whole lot of, of liability issues, and we didn't get safer. This is a study that came out in 2012 in Health Affairs that showed that when you survey uh, large thousands of physicians, many of them would admit the fact that they weren't always open or honest with their patients. And we knew this was creating a problem in that we weren't learning and certainly it wasn't helping us as it turned out later on the liability side. And then this uh, data we knew to be out there already, which is the fact that um, when you really look at claims and lawsuits, 70% of them go away with no indemnity payment once you share all the information. So one of the thoughts we had in the early 2000s was, you know what, why don't we, when harm happens, really reach out very quickly, have these open and honest conversations with patients and families, and avoid a lot of these claims and lawsuits. And sure enough, you'll see the data that that when we put this and hardwired this at the University of Illinois, it made a huge difference and led to a whole lot of federal grant funding we had that we did a lot, again, through the, through the University of Illinois at the time. But what we've learned, and this is very true recently, is this, this unkind acts cascade when the wall of silence goes up is what we refer to as the empathy crisis. I'll share with you is it would cause horrible issues with the, the patients and the families and all, but also to the caregivers. I mean, as many of you may know, the suicide rate amongst physicians has gone up substantially and big contributions to that that people are really beginning to understand is the moral injury that goes along with not being able to get support right away when bad things happen and not being really empowered and encouraged to have open and honest conversations with patients and families. And so there's this wonderful book that's written that I highly recommend. I think it's great for anybody in medicine. It's written by a couple of physicians and it's entitled Compassionomics, the revolutionary scientific evidence that caring makes a difference. And the data is, is, is pretty overwhelming in this about from the public's perspective that we have a lot more opportunity to be more empathic and that even on our side, on the clinician side, 63% of us believe there's been a decrease in compassion in the last 10 years. 
Um, we know that compassion and empathy promote safety. It decreases depression and long-term care. It poses a safety risk. And really importantly, we know that being empathic and compassionate can have a huge impact on lowering your malpractice risk. Um, and so here's our case that we had at the U of I. This is a this was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back that got us to relook at the way we were responding to harm. So as I mentioned, I worked at Michael Reese Hospital as well as the University of Illinois. Um, I actually, my paychecks for the work that I did at uh, Michael Reese were signed by this particular woman who is the former COO at Reese. Um, she came to the U of I and she had a pre-op blood testing done prior to a procedure that was done within our eye and, inner, or eye and ear infirmary ORs uh, at the time. This is not an ophthalmology case. And it showed a white count of 1,000, which is low, but not critically low. And uh, we missed it. We missed it on the anesthesia side. The surgical service missed it as well. Pre-op testing center didn't pick up on it. And so nobody acted on it. So we then, uh, we did the surgery post-op. Um, she had a white count of less than 500. She got admitted. The plan was to be admitted overnight. White count now shows less than 500. And we missed it again. It, it's a weird set of systems issues where it's a critical test result. It gets called to the floor, but the wrong floor. It was relayed to a nurse named Mary at a time there was no nurse Mary taking care of this patient. And so she's discharged and dies six weeks later with a treatable leukemia at Northwestern. And again, this is in the early 2000s. And the CMO at Northwestern reached out to us. I was doing a lot of work within safety and risk management that I went to our leadership at the time and said, hey, this is awful. I've looked at the chart. We clearly missed it. You know, do I have permission to reach out to the husband um, to say, hey, we are so sorry, we missed this. And it likely contributed to, uh, it turns out actually it was his fiance at the time to her death. And I was told, of course, no. The wall of silence was very strong at that time. We got sued. We spent over $300,000 defending this case. Um, there were 42 depositions that included students and resident physicians on both the from the surgical service, as well as the anesthesia service, attending physicians, nurses. It was just God awful. And we spent a fortune and we settled for millions. And it was a big embarrassment to the board of trustees because again, she was one of ours. And this happened at a time when, and I don't know, Joel or, J Joel or Jake, if you remember this, but this was when we had a catastrophic issue related to our liability insurance. St. Paul Insurance had pulled out of the business. They were our excess carrier. We found our self-insurance fund to be $80 million in the red. And so there was gonna be this huge need to increase premiums to everybody throughout the University of Illinois and all of the clinical departments. And so there was this tripartite thing happening of one, we were having more harm than we should have had we now have a huge liability crisis, and then we have this big case on top of this. And so the Board of Trustees said, all right, we need a new approach to how we're gonna manage patient safety, how we're gonna handle these cases. And so they asked us to come up with a process to approach these harm events, but at the same time, can we improve the way that we're communicating? And again, we learned little, we suffered immensely from this case. And so then we were asked to put forward a process recognizing that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And at that time, the delay, deny, and defend approach was huge and, and, uh, and, and something we knew we really needed to embrace. So we spent a year and a half with uh, the business people down in uh, Urbana-Champaign, the College of Medicine, a lot of safety scientists, and we came together to adopt these four principles that were gonna become the way to respond when harm happened at the U of I. The first is, is that we will find a way to provide a effective communication rapidly following all serious harm events. That we will, when our care is bad and we know it's bad and it's caused the harm, 
we will apologize and fairly and rapidly resolve these cases. We'll learn from our mistakes and we will support the patients and families as well as the caregivers throughout when these terrible events happen. And that became kind of the, 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 the roadmap that, that we had talked about doing it. And originally we designed it like this, where an event happens, we'd be notified of harm, we'd begin to review it. If it turned out care was bad, we would apologize and remediate. Um, and then we would collect a database. And when we shared this with patients and families and even some caregivers, they said, you know, you're nuts. You're missing the whole point of what we need to do related to patient safety. And so we said, well, what's the problem with it? What they said was, and this is what we really learned from, from patients and family is, is from their view, every hour that goes by without effective communication following a serious harm event is another harm. And, and boy, did that, did that ring true. And, and, and I will tell you, I'll never forget, I was the anesthesiologist on a retina case that we had after we had put this in place that really drove this home. And it was a case of a elderly gentleman, horrible comorbidities, bad diabetes, needed a, a really, really long retinal procedure done. And, and it was gonna need to be under general anesthesia. There was a thought that no way a block would last long enough, but he was almost too sick for a haircut. And when I was involved in getting his informed consent with the anesthesia or with the ophthalmologist at the time told him this, but that as he said, he would rather be blind or he'd rather die than be blind. And he really wanted to have the surgery done. And so we had a really open conversation with the family. We went ahead and we brought him in the operating room. He was asleep for many, many hours under general anesthesia. We woke him up. He was nice and alert, got him to recovery room. And as I was helping him get off the gurney, because he had to pee, he kind of looked at me and says, I don't feel very well. And he collapsed in my arms and died right there in the recovery room. And uh, despite all efforts to resuscitate, we couldn't get him back. Um, because we'd had that really good informed consent, that really good conversation, I had no idea what the cause of death was, but reached out to the family right away, um, obviously brought them in to the recovery room to be with him and then made a plan that, hey, we would get an autopsy, we'd try to figure out what happened and we would meet with them and share with them everything that we found. And as it turns out, he died from a massive saddle pulmonary embolism that we found on autopsy. And we look back at the chart and he had had a great workup that had been put into place by the retina service and by anesthesia. There was no way to have known this ahead of time. And we had an incredibly open and honest conversation with the family about you know, what it is that occurred. Obviously they were horribly shocked by what has happened, but we're so appreciative of the open and honest conversation both before the procedure, but also afterwards. And it just really demonstrated that power of the, of the empathic you know, conversation. So, Learning from that case and others, we redesigned what the approach was. And it was our first big publication that came out called The Seven Pillars, where this is kind of the flow that we put into place at U of I. When you have these unexpected events, even if there's no harm, it's important for you to report them. And you'll see in a minute why that is, because we often learn from near misses and unsafe conditions. And how do we improve process? But if there is harm, how do we respond immediately and support the docs and the nurses and others involved in the harm events. How do we make sure not, we're not billing for care if it turns out that the care was bad? And then how do we build this communication consult service, which we put into place and launched in 2006, where it was immediately available. If we got a call, we would help the service have these really tough conversations that might happen. And then when it turned out, if there was inappropriate care, how would we apologize, provide a remedy, you know, how might we be able to do this part? And this worked really, really, really well. I'll, I'll never forget the time, uh, Joel, and I don't know if you remember this case where we put the wrong lens in a patient and we discovered it in the recovery room. And immediately the service notified us in the OR, which was fantastic because then we reached out to every other eye room we had going at the time to say, hey, stop everything. Let's just make sure we're not ready to put the other wrong lens in some of the patient. 
but we immediately reached out to the family. We didn't bill them for what had just happened. They were able to be brought back to the operating room. They didn't get billed for that. We were highly apologetic. We were able to take care of this. And there was no claim. There was no lawsuit. And we learned a ton about what we needed to do to redesign the process around making sure that we were, we were doing a, a better job of this. One of the big systems issues we found is there was a lack of handoff amongst the nurses in the eye room at the time to make, again, sure that we had the right lens with the right patient at the right time doing that. But it showed how this process worked really, really well, uh, particularly when you activated it. We, we started sharing this with Dora Hughes, who was the health policy advisor to Barack Obama, who loved the seven pillars when he was a senator. And so when he was elected president, even before he took office, we were asked to put a white paper together and work with him in DC about what might there be ways where we could take this concept and even share it far and beyond just the University of Illinois because we were already beginning to see the results of this on our liability as well as on our safety events. Um, ultimately, we were able to publish um, uh, 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 this work. It was the seven pillars. Here is that first publication that got a lot of notice by the leaders in Washington, D.C. And again, as I said, when Obama got elected president, um, he put out all these grants looking at patient safety and liability. And we were very fortunate at the time to get one of these grants. And ultimately, we touched more than $20 million in federal grant funding to one, demonstrate we could do this in private hospitals with open medical staffs, but also, could we be part of a national team to put together this creation of what became known as the CANDOR Toolkit, Communication and Optimal Resolution, which begins with identifying these events, activating your system, best practices around responding and communicating, and then doing this human factors-based event review so you can learn from this. And again, ultimately, as you learn more, you share more, you support the caregivers, support patients and families, and then if it turns out your care was bad, resolve it. If it turns out your care was appropriate, communicate it with the family. And again, that the data that's now come out related to this shows that it was a very effective way to not only reduce harm, but also reduce liability. The Candor Toolkit was released in May of 2016. And that's when I was over in the Middle East at the time. You know, Deepak was over there at the same time as well. I decided because we'd already started to open the Women and Children's Hospital, I was asked to be the chair of anesthesia and the head of quality and safety. I decided to repatriate at that time and began working exclusively helping organizations hardwire this approach to patient harm. I also did, as I was talking to Peter about, worked with ACGME on the CLEAR program about how it is these kinds of components are super important for faculty development, but also resident education, getting residents involved in this kind of work. And so this is, was a huge paradigm shift compared to what it was that I had grown up with in my training and we had been put into place related to that. So on the reporting side, how you go from delayed to immediate? Again, like the case where we had the lens in the wrong patient or the wrong lens in the right patient, activating that made a huge difference in terms of being able to communicate understand what happened in a, in a fair human process way, supporting the caregiver at that time who felt terrible about the wrong lens go, going in. And how do we provide that immediate and ongoing support? And when it comes to resolution, how to move to an early offer versus making them fight for it. And it was a big deal, especially on the care for the caregiver side, which we launched this really great comprehensive program that was run by one of the psychologists at U of I. So again, this is the diagram. One of the biggest keys here was event reporting. So we had a chance to really engage the anesthesia department in this with a very comprehensive program uh, looking at educating resident physicians around their attitudes, knowledge, and skills related to adverse event reporting. And we published this in the Journal of Graduate Medical Education. And the data in this is just really fun because of, of what it is we discovered. So we created a process here where through our software uh, at the time, uh, we were encouraging residents to have at least one report of at least an unsafe condition every month of their clinical rotation. 
And when that report ran in, it went to the program director at the same time as we got it in safety and risk. And the program director was able to review this every Monday, look at these, these things the residents were saying, going, wow, is there a way we need to change the way we're doing things? And so here shows this huge increase in the reporting from our resident physicians, who at the time, none of them are reporting. And the numbers started to going up logarithmically. And it was really cool to see, especially when you look at the data. So here is just, you know, looking at, I think it was two months of event reporting from the residents. And this was pretty interesting where um, the disruptive provider you see up there, that this is, you can see that we had seven of those events and it turned out this was happening in interventional radiology where the feeling was the residents were getting pushed to go much more fat, go much, go much faster. They weren't prepared as enough. They felt like things weren't safe. So getting this information allowed us to have some adult conversations with our colleagues to try to you know, help deal with that. The other part you can see at the bottom there is we had 17 complications related to uh, um, invasive procedures and we also found at that time, nine of those involved a total lack of appropriate attending physician supervision on the part of anesthesia. And here's the part we published, which is we billed, which means we identified Medicare fraud, which means we had to reimburse Medicare with this because we realized we had a problem. And we then presented this back with our department. We changed a lot of our supervision processes and sure enough, we started to see a decrease in these kind of complications. So this is just one example of what happens when we engage the learners in this kind of work uh, in doing it. And then again, as you can see here, one of the other big components was the, um, the work around communication. Because once you hear about these events, there's a lot more you know, work you can do around uh, um, you know, communication after these you know, serious and significant harm events. So this became you know, critical on the communication consult service. And, and here's one of the pieces there. And I, I'm just wondering, Joel, were you part of the PARS program at the time? Um, yes. Yeah, so, so here's the data and I'll describe this with you. And I don't, do they still do PARS at U of I? Yes. Okay, so. Mike, Mike Warsaw runs it now, I think. Oh, awesome. So, so here's, let me explain a little bit about why that is, because this is just so important, particularly for any of the residents we have who are here. So Jerry Hickson is a great colleague of mine. I do a ton of work with him now. And what he identified many, many years ago is that in any group practice, about 9% of physicians generate 50% of non-solicited patient complaints, and those same physicians also generate 50% of your risk management dollars. So it is, a, it is a really, really important link to kind of the communication and, and the liability issues that are there. What he also found was if you can use your data, especially your patient complaint and grievance data, you can analyze it and look for patterns and trends in there where you can score these complaints and you can, as an organization, identify this small percent of physicians who may be involved in some of these kinds of cases. And, uh, and it can make a huge difference um, in it because if you identify them and then you are able to intervene with these physicians who you identify and you show it, he's got so much data now where he can, he's got it on every specialty, where you can really kind of shine a mirror up to these clinicians who don't wanna be you know, viewed in this way by the patients, but you can share with them their data. And he is still showing that just by doing that, 70 to 80% get better. And that when they do get better, their risk profile improves. And so it was part of the, um, you know, the work that, that was going on. And here's the other piece, that I was able to use, that was, that was pretty cool, Joel, is we knew who some of these physicians were. So when, when we would have a harm event in the hospital and I get notified right away, I know if it involved one of our physicians who struggle 
to have these kind of conversations. And so we would automatically, through safety and risk management, reach out and help facilitate conversations with patients and families. And we knew that was having a big impact on decreasing the likelihood of claims and doing a lot of that, you know, that sort of work. The other piece that then happened, and this is after I left the U of I, but this is more recent data, and I don't know if he's shared this, this with you all, is that in 2017, he published this article in JAMA Surgery, which showed, and this is among surgeons, that, um, and I don't really believe ophthalmologists were a big part of it, given the kind of, of cases, but there, but there may have been, but it was that not only do these outlier physicians who struggle with communication and professionalism, not only do they have more complaints, um, you know, more lawsuits related to it, but they also have increased complications that are, uh, you know, related to the surgeries they do and a much, much higher complication rate, even though they may be technically, uh, good surgeons. And, and when they peeled the onion back and they looked at this, they began to understand that this is, this is probably happening because of it. Again, what, what we would often see at the U of I is when, when you'd have a patient and they got admitted, if they started to deteriorate and the nurses would call the surgeon to say, hey, I'm worried about your patient. If those nurses got screamed at or yelled at, then they would often say, all right, enough already, and they learn not to call for help when patients would deteriorate. Those also were the same kind of patients who were unhappy with their care, would often file complaints or grievances. So there's this, this thought that unprofessionalism causes a culture of people unwilling to step up, unwilling to try to move into, you know, trying to make a, a difference as it's related to, to some of these, these kinds of cases. Um, and so again, it became a, a really, really important issue. Um, you know, that is, that is related to this, this part of it, the communication part, again, and the liability piece, you know, related to that. So there's a couple of other cases I want to share with you that happened to the University of Illinois that really had a huge impact on me and ultimately, um, you know, to a whole lot of other people. And, and the first was when, and it kind of showed the value of, of again, having this, this rapid response. Um, we had a situation where um, at four o'clock in the morning, we handed a baby to the wrong mom who breastfed that baby until five o'clock in the morning. When the nurse realized, oh my gosh, we've got the wrong baby uh, with the wrong mom. And the system was in place there and the nurse knew to call the hotline, you know, oh my God, you know, this is tough. And our risk manager got the call. And um, sure enough, the, the risk manager said, wow, this is way above my pay grade. I'm gonna call the CMO. And of course, at the time, Bill Chamberlain was a CMO. Bill was out of town. And so I was covering for him as the associate CMO. And I get the call and I talked to the risk manager and I said, oh my gosh, you know, we've got a problem. And then my first question was at the time, and, and Joel and Jake, you'll appreciate this. My first question was, who's on call for OB? Because we got to get one of our obstetricians to go in and have a conversation with, this, with two sets of patients, with two, two families, right? The woman who breastfed the wrong baby and the woman whose baby was breastfed. And when... The risk manager finds out who's on call for OB. I cry because it's one of our special PARS doctors. It was one of these docs who had the unique ability to piss off everybody they ever talked to. So now I'm like, oh my gosh, that's not going to work. So then, and as you know, at the time, and it may still be true, family medicine also, you know, delivers babies. And I say, well, who's on call? for family medicine. And it turns out it was Mark Potter, who's one of the most emotionally intelligent docs I ever met. He's got an incredible amount of empathy and, and was a huge big part of putting the program together. 
So then I go, oh my gosh, I got to call Mark. And I call Mark Potter and I said, we've got to go in and have this. This could totally blow up uh, from a whole wide variety of enterprise risk management from the public's perspective, you know, from all this sort of stuff. And, and I said, Mark, are, are you up for this? And he said, absolutely. He said, you know, I've actually been involved in a case not dissimilar to this where breast milk was given to the wrong baby, all that stuff. So he goes in and, and again, having been trained in empathic communication, he has two wonderful conversations with the, uh, both families. In fact, when he, when, he, when he talks to the woman whose baby was breastfed by the wrong mom, he even explains to that mom that, you know, I, I know, you know both of you really, really well. Let me tell you, if I was gonna have another woman breastfeed my baby, it would be that woman. She's amazing. And there's no infectious disease issues. These another thing, none of these other things you need to worry about. He was also able to provide benevolent gestures. There was a ton we learned system-wise about how that event happened. Um, and so no claim or lawsuit came from it. Again, we learned a ton from it, but, but that wasn't the end of the story. So as many of you may know on here, one of my favorite things to do was to teach our medical students in the College of Medicine. And so we would do these patient safety lectures every year and I had the chance to go in and, and do the patient safety lecture to the new, the first year medical students. And I was telling this story and at the end, um, you know, I'm up there with Dave Mayer as well. We used to teach it together. And at the end of the lecture, this woman comes up to me and Dave and she's got tears in her eyes. And she says to us, you know, you don't know who I am, but I'm the woman whose baby was breastfed at four o'clock in the morning. And I was the recipient of Dr. Potter's amazing communication. And I knew when I had my choice of medical schools to go to in the country, I knew I had to come to the U of I. I want to learn how to do this. I want to share this process with my fellow residents. And she ended up having an amazing career. And I know for a period of time was on that communication consult service, helping to do this stuff. It was really, it was one of the most heartwarming moments in my career as an educator to get that kind of feedback and realize we really were, you know, changing the culture. And then we had another case that was a really important one that, um, that led to big changes, it, again, in the program at the U of I. And it actually ended up getting, uh, this ended up getting published in the New York Times. And it was, um, we had, as you guys may remember, Joel and Jake, a lot of non-believers in this stuff. It was kind of the soft stuff. A lot of people didn't really believe in it. And we had one in particular in the Department of Medicine, who was a medical oncologist who thought this was a bunch of hooey and wasn't really bought in until he had a case that really rocked his world. And it was at the time when our electronic record, we had not implemented it in the outpatient realm. We had it on the inpatient, you know, we had Cerner on the inpatient, we did not have it on the outpatient. And we had a case where one of his patients was on the inpatient side and unbeknownst to him, uh, the person who was covering the service decided to go ahead and give this woman with a terrible version of, of breast cancer, her dose of chemotherapy she was scheduled to get. It did not get transmitted over to the outpatient documents. And so when she came into clinic, she got a repeat dose of chemotherapy and uh, seven weeks early. And as you can imagine, she developed unbelievable consequences related to that. I mean, every mucous membrane was bleeding. You know, her tears were, that her urine, she couldn't drink. Um, she had to be admitted to the hospital. She had a central line put in. And at that point, the oncologist came into us in safety and risk said, oh my God, I've got to let her know what happened and I have no idea how to have this conversation. So at the time, you know, we had our, our safety risk manager who'd been really well trained in this, did some coaching and then went up there to the ICU, you know, with the oncologist to explain to this woman that 
what it is that happened to her. And, and again, this is one of those cases you never forget and you realize the power of, of having these conversations. And so um, he explains, he apologizes, explains to her that she's in the hospital because of a mistake that had been made that he was part of that he clearly understood now how it had happened and would make sure it didn't happen again. And, and just again, explain what had happened, reassure her that there'd be no bills for this, that we would be reaching out to try to make her whole and, and to do all that. And this amazing thing happened where she starts to cry and he cries and she reaches out and she hugs him and she says, I am so glad you shared that with me. Um, when you came around on rounds today, I was going to tell you I'd rather die than get this chemotherapy. But because I now know I feel this way, because of a mistake you made, you'll make sure it doesn't happen again, I'm going to have the courage to continue getting this chemotherapy. And she's like a nine-year cancer survivor now, uh, was interviewed as part of this New York Times story along with the oncologist saying, this is the power of this open and honest communication and how it really does contribute to uh, improvement in outcomes and decrease in, 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 in the kind of harm that exists related to that. So, so these are the kind, this is, the, this is what connects the heart with the head. This is what brings you know, so much value and meaning to really having hardwire this kind of process in place to begin to do it. So, so what about the data? So lots of data has come out from this. We were really fortunate with our grant to publish it. Um, here's just some data from the UK showing that when you have a culture of openness with patients and families with each other, this is a really, really highly powered study looking at, you do have lower mortality rates amongst these 137 English national trusts when you compare those that have a really open culture that with those that have the, the delay, the denying, the defend, the don't talk about it, that piece of it, where people don't feel comfortable talking about it. So this was a, a, a fairly recent you know, study that came out in, in 2018 looking at it. And then we, through the grant we got through, one of our grants that we got through the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, we had a chance to publish our outcomes and, and this was looking at 13 years of data. So this is looking at five years of data at the U of I before we put this into place, and then the eight years afterwards. And this shows you our event reporting that shows, and the line in the middle is when we did the intervention, when we launched this in April of 2006. And you can see this huge increase in event reporting and the neat thing about this is a huge percentage of that was coming from resident physicians, but also attending physicians. Because again, Joel and Jake, I don't know if you guys remember this, but, but we were able to put a process in place with Dean Flaherty at the time that there was a metric put in for all the departments that said if the first time we hear about a serious harm event is through a claim or a lawsuit, it was a $50,000 assessment to the clinical department, you know, at the time. And so we started getting reports from everybody all the time when harm events happened. So it, it, it was extremely rare that we would learn about a harm event through a claim or lawsuit. And here's why this is so important. When the actuaries looked at our data and we would go into the market to look at buying our excess insurance, Compared to all other academic centers in the city of Chicago, our data was better than all of them about this early warning that was in place when we had harm events. And it's one reason why we saw a big reduction in what we had to pay compared to other academic centers in the city at the time doing that. Uh, this shows our interprofessional event reviews that we put into place. This was really looking at you know, human factors, engineering, a lot of that stuff. We really started redesigning what we were doing in every one of the services that we had. And we do know that this had a big impact on a lot of the really serious events that were, that were causing us uh, lots of grief as it, as it related to the harm events. These are our claims. This is probably the graph for me, and I have no idea, you know, what it's been doing, you know, since I left the U of I. But this was one of the, the things that we were most proud of. You can see with that intervention, 
our claims almost immediately started showing a huge reduction. And one reason was the improved communication that was happening immediately after these harm events. So people weren't suing us anymore to find out what had happened, which is what the standard approach would be. And we were resolving a lot of cases before claims or lawsuits were filed. We had a bunch of very big cases that came along that, that we were able to deal with this. And so it was, again, when the actuaries looked at this, it was pretty staggering to see the difference. And these are our liability costs that showed that because we were spending a lot less money on defense costs, this was saving us millions of dollars a year. Again, that went back into our self-insurance fund that really showed the big value of this. And I don't have the graph here, I could show it is, we showed over the course of the eight years, a $90 million switch in our self-insurance fund. So we were $80 million in the red. And when I left the U of I, we were about $10 million in the black related to this, which again had a huge impact on stabilizing the liability costs, a lot of stuff that's there. In fact, I still have this plaque that I got from the, the uh, folks at, I'm having a hard time kind of sharing it with you guys to find it there. But anyway, there's this plaque I got from the treasury operations thanking us for the incredible work that we did. But this is what led to, in part, the Candor Toolkit and now working with more than 500 hospitals around the country, putting these kind of programs in place because of the big impact on safety as well as the liability, the professional is, issues and some of the other stuff. The other thing we showed was, you know, this is some of the stuff I shared right now. Um, we also published a paper showing that there was a big decrease in the practice of defensive medicine beyond be, with those uh, U of I physicians, no matter where they practiced in the city, we were actually able to track them even when they weren't working at U of I to show when it came to the normal things uh, that are used to measure defensive medicine, we saw a statistically significant decrease in that, along with a lot of the other kind of information and in, in, uh, in the data that we had there. Um, and so with that, I, I wanted to leave a little time at the end. These are some of the other papers we published. Uh, you can see there uh, in 2018, we published lessons learned from the first 200 hospitals. We're now doing this work with more than 500. One of the biggest projects we have is going on at the entire University of California system around looking at this kind of work. Um, as Deepak knows, I was able to bring some of this to the Middle East with me. Um, the company I work with now, RL Datix, is in uh, 3,500 hospitals, uh, 19 countries. And so the plan is to really you know, find ways to push this out and far and wide as possible. But Peter, with that, I would have you kind of jump back on and open it up to see if you or any others have any comments, questions, uh, you know, anything related to this. But this is um, this is this is the story of of of, of the uh, the path we went on. Dr. McDonald, thank you so much for a you know very powerful discussion about how to approach these types of incidents. Um, this is our first uh, faculty development. Um, series. So um, thank you for being a part of this. So I will open it up. I don't see any comments in the chat. I know at the beginning you said that anybody could put comments in there, but like, uh, we have like Joel's raising his hand. It does look question. like it. Yep. I mean, just, just to, to have some talk about, but um, is this an extension of or the same thing as your sorry works? That was the, sort of the byline that you had in the past. Yeah, well, so it, it, it's sort of a part of that, Joel, it, but it's much more comprehensive because, you know, sorry works was really this idea. If you go in and apologize, you know, everything will be better. But this is coupled with the process improvement piece and the early resolution part, which is when you know your care is bad, apology alone isn't going to work. Um, and you need to find a way to, to kind of resolve that and... Uh, and and to come to some sort of resolution with that. Are there any other questions for Dr. McDonald? I see a, 
Emily's got one here. Let me see if I can, uh, can you pull up her? Oh, wait a minute here. Let's yep. see. Let's see. Uh, Emily, what do you think is the role of a resident in these conversations as an observer of how the attending approaches it? Or is there a structured way to engage residents? Oh my gosh. Ah, great question. Um, I, and, and again, I would, I would go to Joel's wisdom as well as Jake's here. I think that, you know, part of the mentoring of residents is helping them have some of these conversations. Um, and I think there's nothing better than that, than having a, you know, a senior attending physician do that. I, what we would, what we talk about is this, this needs to be a, a very principled and systematic approach where we don't recommend residents or even attendings going in rogue versus, you know, call for help immediately, depending on what's happened. But I think it's, it's a great thing for residents uh, to get involved. I don't know, again, Joel or Jake, from your perspective, but I think it's, 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 a, it's a good way to show them, you know, professionalism and how to do this. Well, you know, there, there are a couple of systems. One is to, to let risk management know through the MIDAS system. And there is on the computer a way of reporting uh, risk and people you can call. And they usually call back fairly quickly, although if it's a minor thing like you drop the nucleus in the operating room, that's something you should report to them. They may not get back to you for 24 or 48 hours. But... Um, I think also all of the faculty, like the attending at the time or the attending you have the best rapport with, is someone to call and ask for help and to call Paul Chan, our department head. And um, I think all of us are aware of the importance of communication. Yeah, that, Joel, I'm glad you mentioned that. The other way that this is really important from the residents and others letting us know is, so we don't bill patients when we know, you know, our care was bad. We had, we had a case where, where uh, through a whole screw up with the way our Cerner was originally designed, we gave a medication a patient was allergic to. They end up in the ICU for two nights. They know a mistake was made, but we weren't notified in safety and risk. The bills go out. They get sent to collections, Joel, and they went nuts. They went to the, an attorney. We ended up paying big on that. And we could have avoided all of it had we known, linked it all together by letting, <laughs> you know, the safety and risk people know as well. There's also another, um, here's, there's another, it, the other question is, is there a way to bring these concepts into our non-university sort of non-institution private practice? There absolutely is. And, you know, Peter, if you want to give them my email address and they want to reach out, we've got all kinds of ways of giving them the tricks, the tools, the resources, the other stuff to help them with this. Because the other group that's really supporting this are the liability insurance carriers. And they, they really are supporting this kind of open and honest communication. They fund a whole lot of our work, uh, again, around the country. So, so Ruby, that's a, that's a great question. And, and we're starting to do more and more of that. We have time for one more question. If anybody has a, a last question for Dr. McDonald before we end our session today, of note the CME code for today. Please enter that onto your CME evaluation form when that goes out this evening so that you can claim your CME. If not, I think that might be all, Dr. McDonald. Again, thank you very much. Thank and you. It, so if you're okay, I. You're okay if I send out your email address? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Okay. You bet. All right. We'll send out a follow-up email um, in the next day or so. You bet. Well, it's Thank been a pleasure uh, seeing, seeing old colleagues here, and, and uh, I sure do miss the golden age. Um, you know, back when we had the uh, Iron Ear Infirmary, our six ORs, the exam room, all that, it was a pretty, pretty spectacular time um, to be there. Thank you very Thank much. You, Good right. evening, everyone. You bet. Take care, everyone. Thank you.